Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. We are so excited to have Rabbi uh, Barry Dollinger here. Rabbi Barry Dollinger is the rabbi of Congregation Beth Shalom, a thriving modern Orthodox hub in Providence, Rhode Island. He is a practicing attorney with expertise in estate planning and employment discrimination. He is the founder of Lighthouse okay. Kosher, you, all of part of the ecosystem. Early for Oops. those of you who are. I'm so sorry. On Apologies for that tech issue there. He is the founder of Lighthouse Kosher, part of an ecosystem of new values-based kosher certification and co-founder of Mitzvah Matzos, a nonprofit soft matzo factory that donates all profits to fight human trafficking. Recently, he joined the International Beit Din as its new executive director, where he is excited to, combat, to combine the power of courage and strategic thinking as a strive to end crisis of Igum. He loves living in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, with his wife, Naomi, and his two daughters, Nitzak and Yael. Thank you so much, Rabbi Barry Dollinger. So thank you all for being here. Can you see my screen um, all right? Uh, so a, a big thank you to Eddie and Jessica and, and Rav Shmuley. Um, I just want to acknowledge, um, I can't see all the boxes on the screen, but I think I saw several uh, staff uh, from the International Beit Din. Um, and I, I think this is actually a great opportunity for folks on the Zoom call and then the people on Facebook Live to get to know some of the, the faces. Um, so we have Susan, uh, who, who works in our office, and also our esteemed, illustrious Menahel Rabbi Warburg. And so um, it's really, uh, Great to have you there. And then there are some board members too. Um, and so uh, grateful uh, to you all for being here. Um, today, I wanted to discuss an overview. Uh, there's a lot of noise out there about the international Beit Din, and then also um, a lot of information about the problem of Igun and the Aguna crisis. So I wanted to try and distill and give a fairly clear presentation of both the problem uh, and the solutions. For everyone who knows me, you know that I'm a huge believer in living in the problem, staying with the problem, coming back to the problem, redefining the problem, exploring new aspects and textures of the problem, uh, because that's where solutions emerge. Um, Igun is not a simple problem. Often it's framed as a simple problem. Uh, I would say the caricature is bad, bad man <laughs> denies and I'll define what the problem is more specifically in a minute, but bad man did not, denies a get, a Jewish divorce document to his wife. Um, and if we can only beat or shame or otherwise cajole this man to do this thing, um, then the problem would be solved. Um, but the truth is that this is a social problem, a cultural problem and a religious problem that's much deeper. Um, and so complex problems require full examination. So that's why I'm gonna spend the first half uh, really getting into this a bit. Uh, so today, we will define the problem. We'll discuss some existing or uh, widely used communal solutions. We'll discuss the halakhic solutions used at the international Beit Din, uh, following on the footsteps of major achronim, uh, greats of, of just the previous era. Um, and then emerging trends and conclusions, kind of an update so that uh, activists, folks out there, all of you are sort of activists, everyone needs to be an activist in this area, um, can be aware of some trends and what exactly those trends are about, what kind of cutting edge new things. Okay. Uh, questions thus far? I'll, I'll pause at different points for questions. So, there are different um, faces of Igun, and I wanted to walk through a, a few of the ways it happens. The classic, now I should say something. The classic example of a Naguna has nothing to do with what occurs mainly today. The you know main modern iteration of that was perhaps the World Trade Center crisis where Rabbi Yonah Reese and folks at the Beit Din of America did important work. Um, but the classic example is a woman whose husband is 
a lost at war or goes on a business journey and doesn't come back. And no one knows exactly what happened to the husband. And so the woman is an aguna. She is stuck chained. Uh, the use in Tanakh of this word, I believe, is in Megillah root, alotea gena, to be chained. Um, and so the woman is stuck because she cannot get the religious divorce to document she needs in order to remarry. Um, and biblically, children of uh, a marriage without a divorce would be mom zerim, would have a status um, that would not allow them to marry and would create great social stigma. And so the women are stuck. That's the classic example of an Aguna. Today, the idea that people ignore their religious obligations and either because of psychiatric kind of conditions, abuse their wives by denying a get, or out of uh, greed or, or just a sense of getting head trying to extort, that is was probably unimaginable um, <laughs> to Chazal and is a Chil Hashem of the highest order. It's hard to um, imagine something that reflects worse on the kind of systems of Jewish religion. Okay, but so what are some examples of the way it manifests today? A man refuses to give his wife a get. Um, many of the cases we see, um, and Rabbi Warburg can unfortunately attest to the gory details of this, um, it's done not for any particular reason, but just out of plain spite and vengeance. Uh, often divorce disputes themselves become quite uh, hot and animate, um, acrimonious. And so um, it is seen as a form of abuse or revenge or regularly, as we'll see in one of the cases we'll describe today. Uh, men are remarried somehow, rabbis permit them to remarry and are living with new partners. Um, and it is almost always in these cases a pattern part of a pattern of abusive and coercive behavior. So it's never just the get, right? Often it comes with, um, and just a warning for those out there, right? A lot of the things we'll be describing today are deeply disturbing and involve uh, physical violence and, and sexual violence. We're not gonna get into too many details of that, but just in general, they, so our cases involve that in, in many, if not all cases, that is also part of this. And so get abuse, should be seen rightly as part of a pattern of abuse and it should be called get abuse. So that's, that's one way it happens. Um, another related way it happens is extortion. Um, I will <laughs> give you your get um, if you give me, uh, for example, in one of our cases, $250,000. There's just a plain price on the get. Um, without getting into identifying details, there's you know, a case in our file where the woman has been told, show up to Beit Din alone. You'll get your get on such and such date. But if you come with anyone, um, then you will not get your get and be prepared to write a check. So it's not just that And in that case, there's a restraining order out against the husband, there's a history of violence. And so women are being asked to be uh, put in vulnerable situations, often when there is a history of proven violence, um, and to pay, uh, either in terms of custody arrangements. Now, what's important to understand is that this case, the one I'm describing now, extortion, is where the problem gets defined down. Uh, recently, I attended a lecture by a noted and sympathetic rabbi um, in the modern Orthodox community, and he said, I'm going to be honest, there are just not that many cases of Igun, of Agunot. Uh, I've been living here, and I, I don't see him. And I would uh, submit that that's because the definition being used is wrong. Um, so I, I wanted to quote uh, to you all from a new book by Daniel Greenberg. Uh, it's called Getting a Get. Uh, Daniel Greenberg is an understated uh, Orthodox barrister in the UK. Um, he is um, a jolly character. Is it right to say that about British people? And he's great. Um, and he is an upstanding member of the Orthodox community who's been doing work. And he, he wrote a book as a lawyer, as a barrister. Um, and um, he had an exchange with Rabbi Zimmerman. Rabbi Shragel Feibel Zimmerman last year, and he publishes the exchange in his book. 
And um, I would recommend, by the way, that for people interested in the details of this, obviously it's in the UK, so it's across the pond, but getting a get um, is a worthwhile purchase and you can only get it on Daniel Greenberg's website. So Rabbi Zimmerman there writes to him, the amount of intractable cases is just not that many. And he goes on. And Rabbi Zimmerman is the head of the Federation Besden. And so the, the head of the business, and there just aren't that many cases. And I heard the same thing from a sympathetic modern Orthodox rabbi. But of course, as Rabbi Zimmerman writes, that's because of not covering um, extortion. So here's what he says. Uh, rabbi Zimmerman is certainly not lying but he is definitely defining the problem in a way that excludes a large number of cases that others would classify as get refusal. In essence, Rabbi Zimmerman considers get refusal as covering cases where one or other party to a marriage is refusing outright to give or receive a get. He does not include the common experience of large numbers of women who in the course of divorce are told that if they want to receive the get in a timely fashion, they will need to pay an amount of money or agree to a particular pro proposal in relation to the division of the assets of the marriage. These cases of imposing conditions on the delivery or receipt of a get, which might be described as get exploitation rather than outright get refusal, are very much part of the problem that this work, the book he wrote, addresses. And so that's important, get abuse, um, using a religious divorce and withholding it for a sum of money, extortion, he calls it exploitation, uh, is part of the problem. And I will note in my experience as a pulpit rabbi, maybe other pulpit rabbis on the call can, can validate this or not, um, the fear of get exploitation hangs over virtually every Jewish divorce in the Orthodox community. Rarely are divorces pleasant. And in every case, the woman is concerned, what am I going to have to give up? And we simply don't know. You know, someone will say, well, how many women are forced to give up concessions in order to get their get? We have no way of knowing. But anecdotally, the number is extremely high um, and of deep concern. But that's not all of the problem either. <laughs> There's yet a whole further series of cases that are not captured uh, in the public imagination. Many courts, and, and this is where um, we, we get into the problem a little bit deeper and understand that the system of Jewish courts, look, we're a Jewish court. We're a proud Jewish court. Jewish courts are important as a way of doing Jewish jurisprudence um, with ethics and giving the glory of the legal system all, all at merit. But it's an open secret noted Gedolim and Poskim, uh, religious decisors regularly decry the state of existing religious courts when they speak. Uh, Rav Asher Weiss was just speaking at a continuing legal education, and he went on to say that the state of the courts is an embarrassment. Uh, and, here with the, and, and that's an accurate assessment. So many Bate Din, as a matter of policy, will not send a Hasmana. A has, so I need to explain a little bit about Bate Din process for folks to understand. Um, the, the, the lecture here, uh, just monitoring the comments. Um, so in a court, um, people will get a summons. Usually they'll get three summons or, or a hasmana before they will be uh, ruled in contempt of court for failing to go and be given a C-roof, um, a document that says that they have failed to reply and attend the court. And the C-roof, the, the equivalent of a contempt of court for failing to show up, uh, comes in, in Jewish law with um, sanctions and stigma, or is supposed to. So... Many bate den, many courts, the proposal courts will not um, send a summons to a husband if the civil divorce is, sorry, go back one here. Uh, if the civil divorce is not complete. So you have a case where the civil divorce is pending and folks are litigating, let's say in secular court. And the woman, meanwhile, is not, able even to bring her husband to court. Perhaps this husband who's no longer living with her is remarried or living with someone else. Um, and yet still, she, she's not an aguna. She can't, she's not even in the system. 
or many courts will refuse to issue a siruv, an order of contempt if the civil divorce is not complete. So this prevents women from being seen as aguna, aguno because they're not in the system, if that makes sense. Um, and then another issue is complete adjudication, uh, ignore the spelling error there, according to halakha. This is a, another problematic issue. Many courts will deem the woman at fault if she will not submit all matters, including custody and finances, everything at play in the divorce to the Beit Din, to the Jewish court to be governed by halakha. But those courts will often, as a matter of course, interpret halakha to deny or limit women's property rights. Uh, in the United States, we have two, and we're gonna get into this, two ways of viewing property rights in divorce. Uh, we're gonna get into specifics today. I hope that's helpful so people really learn something. Um, halakha, you know, halakha is fuzzy. It can be interpreted in different ways on this. So, so we recently saw um, a writing that our, our West Coast coordinator sent us, a chuba, formal written piece, by an important rabbi in a West Coast court um, at length explaining why women should not be afforded uh, property rights like in secular society. And so women are forced to either submit to a forum which does not even recognize their property rights or not be in the system and not be capable of being kind of called and turned in aguna. Um, okay, so those are just some of the ways that women are aguno more than just man won't give a divorce, but they can't even get onto the docket as it were. Just a, a little bit of history. Um, the picture there is actually a drawing from an 1870 Wisconsin proceeding <laughs> where um, a, a new law was passed changing the way marital property was divided. And in the 19th century as a kind of precursor to the suffragette movement, um, there was a movement to afford women uh, property rights <laughs> by law in marriages. The, one of the first was New York's 19, 1848 Marital Property Act. And what happened in the United States um, are two systems. One is called the system of equitable distribution, whereby judges will be governed by a standard of seeking to divide property in a divorce equitably based on a series of enumerated factors, how much people work to contribute. But still, they're trying to divide the property equi uh, equitably, not directly in half, but equitably. Nine states, primarily in the West, or almost all in the West, um, have a different regime called community property. Uh, folks may be familiar with this, and in a community property state, the property in the marriage that is acquired during the marriage, um, unless contracted otherwise, is split down the middle. It is not um, subject to a judge's equitable judgments. It is divided equally, but property prior to the marriage or outside the marriage um, remains that of the individuals. Um, either way, both of these regimes um, are legal attempts to um, adjudicate an end of marriage dissolution fairly and equitably with justice in mind. They're just two different legal regimes of doing so. And so it makes sense that women will want to turn to any one of the 50 states courts um, to have their property divided somewhat equitably rather than Jewish courts, which maybe even on record is saying, we do not recognize your equal property rights um, in the marriage. Now, there are notable exceptions, like the baked in of America is per perhaps the notable exception um, in using equitable district and other things as, as kind of stands-ins for halakha and uh, assumptions about that being the expectation of the parties. But that's the exception that proves the rule, which is part of why women don't want to go to these forms. And then when they do go to those, forms, they may get their get, but they're giving up so much else. And so this is part of the problem too. Um, questions at this point? I think this is gonna conclude my kind of statement about the texture of the problem right now. So, so it involves men often and mental health, and it involves um, courts and it involves law, and it also involves politics and culture. Um, we'll, we'll move on then. 
So what else works? What else works? So existing Bhatik, then we've described that. I have a question, a quick question. Yeah. Um, given what you said about it being cultural specifically, are you finding situations like this happening? I don't know if this is something you can answer, but are you finding it happening in certain countries more often than others? I mean, I know the US is enormous and Israel is just totally Jewish, but are there like instances like, is there a British culture that, that you don't find the Agonaut situation really happening? So you definitely find the Agonaut situation happening in the UK. Um, you find it happening everywhere, frankly. Uh, you find it happening in Orthodox society and in non-Orthodox society. You find it happening. But um, if dem demography from Israel is any guide, and that's the place where there's good demographic data on this from the many advocacy groups there, you find it in increased numbers and percentages in the communities you would expect. Um, those that are more politically conservative or culturally conservative. So I, I don't I don't mean this is a disparagement, but right, you find it more in in Haredi society and you find it more in Mizrahi, East, you know, East um, folks uh, who are descendants uh, from you know, Arab countries and and that kind of thing. You find Persian communities, you find it more. Um, wherever the gender roles are more traditional, right? And wherever uh, that that's, but you find it everywhere, just to be clear. It's not that it's not in other communities. You know, you'll, you'll find it in reformed Jewish communities in modern North, but so, um, does that answer your question, uh, Nicholas? Yes, really interesting. Cause I, I, I was playing, I was relating it to what you said about, you know, the more patriarchal type society. So you really um, answered the question there. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I don't know that there's been great demography in the United States on this, but in Israel, there've been a lot of studies and controversy about those studies, all that. Um, so uh, that's actually a great segue to one of the first answers that is promoted, um, halakhic prenuptial agreements. And we are big fans of halakhic prenuptial agreements. Uh, I signed a halakhic prenuptial agreement and I won't officiate at a wedding where there isn't one. Um, what these are, are agreements agreed to um, in anticipation of an upcoming marriage um, that um, at least the standard baked in of American version stipulate that if the wife, if the husband won't give a get to the wife and they're not living together after X amount of time, and it's clear that a divorce should be given but is not being given, um, the baked in, the court will institute uh, a financial, not a penalty, but you know, you're still married. So here's, <laughs> here's what you need to be providing uh, for your wife. Um, and so kind of stipulating the amount of marital support uh, in that situation, uh, which can then be enforced. Uh, and certified in court. Um, that's good. It basically puts the husband on the books, you know, with a running toll for each day a divorce is not given. So why is that not a great solution or the single most promising solution to the Aguna crisis? So it is for people who sign it. Uh, <laughs> uh, the problem is, um, not with the prenuptial agreements themselves, but the fact that um, they haven't been accepted in the most socially conservative societies for the very reasons one might expect, um, either because of legal opposition or more likely because of opposition to perceived feminism or things like that. And so uh, while halakhic prenuptial agreements may be popular in modern Orthodox Jewish society, they're not widely popular outside of the Orthodox world. Um, and they're also similarly not used in um, a Haredi society or, or the uh, ultra-Orthodox, for lack of a better term, world. And so it's precisely the communities where the problem is worse, where they'll be most resistant to preemptively using this solution. So that is the, it's not a knock on the solution. And if folks would be able to get it more acceptance in those communities, that would be great. Uh, but as it currently stands, um, it, faces that relatively serious drawback of not being useful in the cases it's most needed. Um, a second possibility is shaming and protest. I have a picture of one such protest on the screen for you. Um, and folks are familiar with organizations like ORA, which do this. 
and it's good. The thing is, um, first of all, um, it's not always effective. Second of all, that only works when men are sufficiently embedded in the Jewish community such that the disapproval of the Jewish community is going to matter a lot to them. Third, it's a decentralized Jewish world. Folks can leave one community, fly to a different country, embed themselves in a new community that doesn't know or doesn't care. Um, and then finally, there is um, something quite distasteful about the idea that in order to obtain a divorce document, which is owed to them, Jewish women should have to become self-promoters and organizers of social protest movements outside the homes and businesses of their uh, husbands. Um, it empowers the husband still and does not alter the leverage in the situation. Um, so while they may be effective and good, um, they leave something uh, um, very much to be desired. And then existing Bate Din, we've talked about. Um, there's not necessarily even agreement about the scope of the problem. And I would say tacit promotion of the underlying causes of the problem, not as a willful um, kind of, uh, you know, malicious intent, but nonetheless, uh, all of the things we outlined uh, promote the problem. And so these are existing solutions, which are helpful in some cases, but are not overall a solution to the problem. And so agunot proliferate in the United States and throughout the world. Um, questions? Actually, I would love to ask one actually. Sure. Um, about the halakhic prenup, just because it feels to me that unless there's the ability to grant by default, then the contract really is as only, only as good as the person that signs it. So if their amount that is owed increases, well, then the extortion amount can increase. So if enough time passes, can you include a clause that it's like granted without the consent of the husband, which I know happens in some cases, um, like by default, or can he just continue to extort for greater and greater amounts? So, so you're asking, can the prenuptial agreement includes a, a cause that annuls the marriage itself after a certain period of time? Sure, exactly. Yes, yeah, so there, there are such prenuptial agreements out there. Um, and um, you know, certainly in halakha, those very well should have the status of a kind of condition on the marriage. Um, that if a marriage, so you know, we'll, we'll discuss that a, a little, I mean, people do that. Um, um, I'm not going to discuss that now for the same reason, which is that um, kiddushin al tanai, you know, conditional marriage is yet more controversial, maybe not halakhically, but socially, than even prenuptial agreements themselves, meaning even in societies that use prenuptial agreements, halakhic prenuptial agreements, or as parts of the Jewish world, um, kiddushin al tanai, a kind of conditional marriage, is not generally done, let's say. Um, and so in communities yet further religiously to the right, for lack of a better term, um, that is yet more radical. But halakha, of course, for folks that learn, you know, the Talmud and Kedushin or doing the Dafyom, the, there's no limit to the conditions, uh, or maybe not no limit, but there, there are, you know, conditions on marriages are um, part and parcel of the breadth of the oral tradition. So... I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, I just find it frustrating. Those that are likely to extort are going to do it anyways. So it's hard as a woman to think how I can best protect myself. And I'm not sure if that if that's the avenue or the tool that I'm going to use, but I guess it's better than nothing. <laughs> and I, I believe the, uh, the Center for, uh, National Center for Women's it's the Israeli organization. I, I can get, if folks want, I can you know, get you an example of a prenuptial agreement that includes a cause just like what you're saying. Uh, um, there's also Rabbi Broy's tripartite agreement and others. Uh, so there are uh, prenuptial agreements out there floating around that, that do those things uh, cool. to be. Thank you, Rabbi. Um, um, but was there another question? If it's okay, uh, I think this is a question. It's also partly just a scream of frustration that Chazal 
instituted or recognized that the Torah instituted the institution of Ketubah in order to give the wife the upper hand in divorces. And their assumption was that the Ketubah was going to force the husband to pay if there's going to be a divorce. And as you said before, they didn't even anticipate the possibility that the husband would leave his obligations to the marriage and the Beitin would tolerate his not giving a divorce if he's not interested in providing her with food, clothing, and conjugal rights and shelter. Um, the thought that now we're going to invent a prenuptial agreement and that could be controversial. When Chazal said every marriage has to have a prenuptial agreement that gives the wife the upper hand uh, is just so extraordinarily frustrating. Yes, uh, so uh, I'll double down on, on your comment, Rabbi, and it's good to see you, um, to say that this is all maddening and infuriating, which is why the International Beitim was formed and exists, and we're going to get to what we do, which doesn't rely really on anyone uh, and their behavior. Um, <laughs> but um, I'll double down by noting that the Ramban, Nachmanides on the Torah, notes that the institution itself of a get, of a written divorce, um, was similarly an initiative that would prevent husbands from divorcing their wives one day and the next day uh, taking them back or going for a fling and claiming otherwise, you know? And so the entire institution of written divorce itself was, you know, in that view, uh, a protection in the time uh, for women who are in a vulnerable state. And so um, the ketubah is just a further example. And then subsequent medieval decrees that allow the wife um, to both refuse to accept a divorce and require the wife's uh, consent um, about the process are, are, are similarly um, rabbinic efforts throughout history. And so you know, I'm skipping, of course, the, the Mishnahic efforts to say that in the case of an aguna, um, you know, one of the, the great institutions of the, the Mishnah and Gitin is that if uh, and other places is that if uh, that an aid achad one witness is sufficient to determine a husband's death and it doesn't necessarily need to be a classically accepted witness and so throughout at every stage of this process through Jewish history folks tried to help and bench the rules as far as possible mishum igun akilu rabbanan because of the fear of agunot then rabbis were lenient is the adage of the Talmud. Except today, <laughs> um, anything that is, you know, bent in favor further of women is accused of being feminist, whatever that means. And so it's the opposite. Um, and so you're right to say this is a, in, in large part, a, a problem, you know, of the Jewish community and a problem of courage and of vision. Um, that's upsetting. And given that problem, what will we do about it? What will we do? We cannot tolerate uh, that continuing to be the case. Um, I'm on the fence about, but I think it's worth sharing at least some of the sources given the learned nature of this audience um, to just establish, well, I wanna say a few things. Um, Rabbi Warburg is here, and he would be the first, I think, to tell you that one of the ways we differ is that we obligate the get. Many courts in the diaspora, if not all, do not issue a ruling that says that a man is obligated to give a get. They handle this issue backhandedly by issuing summonses. And then when the summonses are not responded to, if they issue the summons, they will issue a siruv, an order of contempt. And the social sanctions that result from protests like the ones that Ora do are not because of any failure of the get, at least in the court record. They're because of the failure to appear before court and to submit to religious authority. At the international bait din, we deal with the substance of the matter and issue an opinion as to whether in fact the man is obligated under Jewish law to give a get with the different distinctions therein. But that, that is an important thing. Um, Another important thing that people need to know 
is that in many of our cases, gitten wind up being given. And I think this is a, a kind of misnomer about our bait and, and its work. And that happens in two ways. Either the dedicated involvement of our talented staff uh, are able to hear women where other courts literally won't even respond and help cajole the get. Um, or sometimes the threat of going to the international bait din um, causes people to just give the get. Or sometimes our rulings freeing the women cause the subsequent giving of the get. After all, if I'm a man and I'm holding out to extort my wife and She's now free by three rabbis, even if I don't like those three rabbis, and if even my rabbi says he doesn't hold by those three rabbis, nonetheless, if she's free, the leverage is gone. And so many times getting into, um, I tried to count how many that happened in, I don't know, but it's dozens of times that has been the case. And so, yeah. 12, 85 times we're able to broker a get with our gunos up to 15 or 25 years, okay? Over, over five times. I think the number I counted is 93, could be. Okay. So, so that's something that people um, need to know at the outset. And now, when that doesn't happen, <laughs> when there's no prenuptial agreement, no condition on the marriage, no get forthcoming, um, what can we do? So... It is a misnomer of Jewish law to say that if there's no get, there can never be the possibility of remarriage. And, and that comes straight from, from the Talmud itself. Um, I just wanted to point to three Talmudic, this is the time to put your Gemara cup on, uh, you know, to get your Talmudic thumb out. Um, I, I'm gonna do it in English just so everyone knows, although maybe the Hebrew would be, would be useful. Um, there are three uh, central sugyot that relate to the possibility of a mekach taut, um, that a marriage was undertaken under false pretenses. And they are uh, of different direction. And the resolution, how you resolve three seemingly disparate passages um, is part of how the legal consensus uh, emerges. So, the Mishnah in Ketubot gives the following case. Uh, in the case of one who betrothes a woman on condition that there are no vows incumbent upon her. This is a Svaria translation, by the way. So they've added lots of words that aren't in the Mishnah, but it's all from Svaria. And it was subsequently discovered that there are vows incumbent on her. She is not betrothed. This is Svaria adding now. This is because if the condition is not fulfilled, the betrothal is nullified. The marriage is no longer... It, it, a false pretense. He married her without specification, and it was, but if he married her without specification, nothing was said, and it was subsequently discovered that vows were incumbent upon her, she may be divorced without payment of her marriage contract, the Ketuba, since, since she discovered a deficiency about which she had not initially informed him. However, this does not invalidate the betrothal since he did not make any explicit condition. And similarly, if he betrothed her on condition that she has no blemishes, moon. And it was subsequently discovered that she did have blemishes. She is not betrothed. But if he married her without specification, and it was subsequently discovered that she had blemishes, she may be divorced without payment of her marriage contract. But a get is needed. In other words, if a man says, we can discuss whether it needs to be formal or not, or if a woman says, I am only marrying you on condition that you do not have any major blemishes, then if major blemishes are discovered, it will invalidate the marriage. But if a woman, or in the case of the Mishnah man, says nothing, then blemishes, subsequent blemishes, do not affect the legal validity of the marriage. And so the conclusion you would um, derive from this Talmudic passage, the, the Mishnah in Ksubis, is that uh, in general, there's not a mekach ta'ut, a law of, and that, that means um, a, a, um, a transaction under false pretenses. Um, and I just want to name that using transactional language to describe a marriage uh, is the language of Chazal, but I don't, I don't want to, of the sages, but obviously that's, that's a deficiency of language, I'm going to say. We'll say more about that. Um, 
but you would understand from here that there's not in general a notion that if you get married and you later discover that there were all kinds of problems that you didn't know about, the marriage is void. If you marry someone without specification and you subsequently discover problems, the marriage remains. That's what this passage says. However, <laughs> there's a different passage. Two others actually I wanted to bring. Um, so you're dealing with a case people may know in ancient times, the, the, the Jewish marriage ceremony we have today, um, the Kiddushin, the Eresin, and later the Nisuin happen all in one ceremony, usually with the reading of the Ketubah in between. Uh, you have the ring at the start and the Sheva Brachot at the end. But in olden days, they happened about a year apart and people would be engaged, but engaged there is really, you know, the first part of the wedding ceremony. And so it's uh, a formal uh, halachic status. And so we're dealing here with the case of someone who is not yet married, but the kiddushin has happened, not the full marriage in that interim period to a kohen, to a priest who is allowed to eat from consecrated offerings of truma. So can she, the question is, if you follow, <laughs> Can this woman um, eat during the interim period of the truma of the Cohen's designated food offerings? If I've lost you, don't worry, follow it. So Ula said by Torah law, uh, so the Mishnah says, if the appointed time for the wedding arrived and they did not get married, she may partake of the truma. Ula said by Torah law, the daughter of a non-priest betrothed to a priest may partake of trum immediately, as soon as the kiddushin happens, even before the wedding date arrives. That's the Torah law, um, because it uses the uh, language of acquisition. And so that's already happened. Therefore, she's entitled to partake of truma. What then is the reason that the sages said she may not partake? The Torah says she can eat the truma during the interim period, but the rabbis say she can't, and why not? Lest someone pour her a cup of truma wine, so the first answer is while she is in her father's house, Although she may drink it as the betrothed of the priest, since she is still living in her father's house, there's a concern she'll give it to her brother or sister. She's not yet in her husband-to-be's house. And so when she's eating this food, someone who is not allowed to eat it is going to be in her house and going to eat it. And it's going to create a problem, a technical problem. But Rav Shmuel Bar Yehuda says, the reason is due to simphon, cancellation of the contract. After she gets married, there could be a moon. And that moon, that blemish, might invalidate retroactively the marriage, as Rashi explains. And so you see here from this Talmudic passage of Rabbi Shmuel, um, Bar Rav Yehuda, there's a concern for a notion that seems implicit of a marriage that is annulled without a get because of a mistaken transaction. And so do you see that the, the the passages disagree. One seems to imply there is not such a doctrine and the other implies there is. Uh, I'm not gonna get into it, but because it's maybe the most complicated Mishnah there is for folks that have been doing Dafyomi, that first Mishnah in Yavamot. But there also, there is a case of an Ailonit, a woman who is, the translation from Safari is sexually underdeveloped. And, um, and the marriage there um, is, annulled. That's the point. So you have two passages which clearly have a kind of annulled marriage or mecca ta'ut. Um, okay. And one that does not. So importantly, the Tosafo resolved this by saying, well, there's a difference between an ailonit, a sexually underdeveloped woman, and other blemishes. Because that goes, and, and the Tosafo rid explains further, that goes to the heart of the marriage. Um, other Rishonim, medieval commentators explain that children, um, sexual intercourse are significant features of marriage, major features of marriage. And, and so without the viability of major features, it 
is considered a mekach ta'ut. And so there's a difference between what we might call, what some of the Rishonim call mumin mechuarin, um, extra detestable um, blemishes and regular blemishes, which becomes in the language of the Achronim and the later authorities, mum gadol. So the way that sages distinguish these passages is some of them, some do not accept this. Uh, we could get into the pill pull of it at a different time that folks want. But basically the way that folks deal with disparate passages, many Rishonim and a lot of major authorities, including Svi Pesach Frank, Rav Moshe Feinstein and others, is to understand that the, the cases of the Talmud are dealing with um, two different kinds of blemishes, uh, a relatively minor blemish and a relatively major blemish. And major blemishes are understood to invalidate a marriage or, or cause a mekach That is probably the most important kind of Talmudic basis. Folks always like to understand the causes of things and how the debate evolves. How you deal with these Talmudic passages is ultimately the first and most important precursor as to whether you understand um, <clears throat> this solution to exist. But if you understand it in the way that most of the medieval authorities do, you understand that for a major blemish, and some are more expansive and some are less expansive in their lists, um, marriages can be retroactively annulled if the woman or man didn't realize what they were getting into. Okay. So should we do a real case? We'll do a real case. So this is case number 253. Um, got questions at this point? I know that was very technical. I'm almost positive I lost someone there, but I think it's important for folks to just understand that this has basis in the Talmud, medieval authorities, and subsequent major post key. You know, we could have a different class on the details of it, but questions? Let me, it's not a question, it's a comment. Let me point out that uh, if you have read, and if you read anything else in the, in the Gemara or the Rambam, the Rush, the Shulchan Aruch, all the restatements, all deal with mumei ha'isha. When you're dealing with the defects of a wife, where a, hus where a husband was not told something before, okay? These, were why these are wives' defects. Our cases, we're talking about husbands' defects. That you don't find in the Talmud, you don't find in, the, in, in most of the poskim. You find it basically in the world of Shailot to Shuvot, the response of literature. And the first one to discuss it is Rashi and his Shuva, and the second one probably it was not a tshuva, but it's a safer chidushim was the Or Zarua, 12th mm. in France. I just wanted to point that out. Yeah, so that, that's an important note. And I guess I would um, add by saying um, that you won't be surprised to, under, uh, to learn that the, the reasoning of a mistaken transaction crosses over the logic, the svara of it, uh, regardless of the gender. And that, by the way, is also true for deception and other matters. And the single gender direction of the Talmudic statements is probably because of the single gender <laughs> direction of the Talmudic authors and general cultural context of that, right? Um, thank you, Rabbi Warburg. Uh, yes, Import that's important and I appreciate that note. Um, so here's a case, just to get a sense of what we deal with. And this was a case where we ruled, the Beitin ruled, I was not at the Beitin yet, but um, that there was a, uh, a significant moom gadol. Uh, so the woman who came before the Beitin uh, wanted to be free. The couple was married in full accordance with Jewish law on February 22nd, 2013 husband from Canada, wife from New York. After their marriage, the couple lived in Long Island until their separation. Several months after their wedding, the wife discovered that her husband uh, used drugs and as time passed, it became clear that the drug use was exceedingly massive. The wife understood that the defendant was using hard drugs. The husband began to disappear for periods of time, which became longer and longer. When he returned home, his self-control and control over his reactions lessened over time. His unrestrained behavior became so severe that he threatened his wife and raped her and he was unable to um, 
hide or conceal his condition. The wife was shocked to discover that the husband had regular contact with both male and female prostitutes and with women who work for an escort service several times a week and occasionally several times in a single day. The wife who had become pregnant found it necessary to have an abortion after consulting with a rabbinical authority and being advised to do so because she discovered that the defendant had infected her with a sexually transmitted disease. Um, I don't know if I need to go on. You get a sense of the situation we're dealing with. Um, Okay, in 2016, skipping to relevant parts at the bottom of the fact pattern, when the wife understood the situation in full and overcame her fears, she requested a get. Now that's important, when the wife understood the situation in full, and this is what I want to say. There is a notion that floats around, um, something called Savra Vikibla. I was gonna say, by show of hands, who's heard of that? Um, you can show your hands if you want, if you're showing, I don't even see you, yes. And, and that basically means, okay, there is a defect. And okay, she would not have gotten married had she known, but by remaining in the marriage, she is, once she knows, the woman is agreeing at that point and onward. And so you can no longer say that there is um, a mekach ta'ut. Uh, Rav Moshe Feinstein references this a lot in his chuvo, which is why, this becomes important. Um, some of the ways, sometimes women leave immediately upon discovering, but sometimes, particularly in cases of domestic abuse um, or in cases, so sometimes there's domestic abuse and we know that women don't only not leave abusive relationships because they agree to them. <laughs> it is dangerous and difficult. And also, um, Many times, uh, women do not understand the full extent of the abusive relationships they're in, either because the men are concealing the full extent as in a case like this, or because there's gaslighting or, or, or others. Um, May I say like, something? May I say yes. Something? My, I was case law in New York with Reb Maisha. I'm Nemsov versus Nemsov. Nobody told me he was gay when I got married. They told me when I was getting my guest. They found him in tells with another guy, right? He was also abusive. And they told me that I can't get a get because I didn't leave. But I was a Basiaco girl. And we went to college classes. And no time ever in my education did anyone, any college teacher, any teacher in Basiaco ever tell us that when you get married and a guy starts to abuse you, you walk out and you never go back because then what's going to happen is you're going to be stuck. And my father, Schlepp, my father, who was world vice president of the Alberta, Ronnie Warburg knows me. I lived in Teaneck for many, many years. I told Reb Moshe point blank, I had tried to kill myself when I was married to this guy and I had a baby. And I told him that if he didn't get me out of the marriage, the next time I try to commit suicide, I will succeed. And I meant it. And he began to realize that this is also an issue of pikuach nefesh. That's when he changed the minha kahalacha, because I also said to him, I don't understand you. You don't let us go and get a civil divorce. So not only are you punishing us that way, you're also forcing us into penury because we have no way to get any income other than sponging off our parents or snoring. And that's crazy. You have to give us some kind of a way that we can survive with or without the get. So he changed the minha kahalacha, let me go for my divorce first. And he put into the divorce that he had to give me the get or be held in contempt of court. Then Svi Wilamowski and the Aguda sued for separation of church and state. So Reb Moshe sat down with Shelley Silver and changed New York state law to make sure that not only would Jews be affected, but non-Jews would also be affected by saying anybody in the state of New York who prevents an ex from getting married again doesn't get community property or custody. And that was the first step in breaking up this insanity. Now, what I don't understand is 
I've spoken to prosecutors and I don't understand why extortion and blackmail are not seen as extortion and blackmail because of this fake separation of church and state. It's blackmail, extortion. It could be filed under RICO statutes, especially if the rabbis in these basins, like Mayor Kin's basin, are complicit in extorting money from an Aguna's family and from the Aguna herself. It has nothing to do with halacha. It has everything to do with criminal law. And I do not understand for the last 50 years why this has not become it's the way to get things done. So um, I, I, I just want to acknowledge the, uh, first of all, I appreciate you sharing um, everything you just shared. And, you know, I think, um, I just want to say, I'm not responding to the content yet, but folks on the call will get a sense of just how uh, tragic, painful, and um, unnecessary this all is. Um, and so I, I should wish to share your anger and outrage um, uh, a thousand percent. Um, as to the legality of using RICO and Black... So I will talk a little bit about that at the very end with course of control in a minute or two. Um, if, you, if you hold on for a second, maybe we'll try and cover some of the legal arguments, but it, it feels um, um, not appropriate to, to quite delve into that when I wanna, if it's okay, highlight something more important that you said. Um, and, th and that's the following, that in all the, so that if folks understand what is at stake, um, uh, the Get Out UK, an organization in the UK has done some surveying of its clients where they're trying to help women who are not receiving their get. And what we're finding is that in, in what they're finding is I think in, in more than 50% of the cases, um, and understandably, this sort of abuse, which isn't even seen as abuse, causes depression, anxiety, suicidality, um, and, and, and that's because it's a horrific form of, of pernicious abuse. Um, we also see um, that, and we see that get abuse causes people, particularly women and their friends and colleagues and families to loosen their ties to um, religion, uh, the Jewish religion, not, not in a, you know. Oh, you mean like going off the derech? Well, I don't want to call it that. I went off the derech, and now I say I'm on a different derech. I don't like OTD. Yeah, I'm not so off the derech, I'm on a different one. That's right, and and the reason is um, understandably that you know when this, if this is the religion, in fact, um, then people uh, wind up right. So part of what we are doing at the IBD, just so folks understand the context, is to say, this is how a Beitin would run if it were excellent. This is how a Beitin would run if its menahel was as dedicated as Rabbi Warburg. This is how a, how a Beitin would run if we're committed to using all of the halakhic tools and not um, being afraid of what the critique would be, etc. cetera. So we're, we're out of time, um, I'm told. Uh, I guess what I want to say is just in conclusion, Maybe that was a good conclusion. In this case, 253, the Dianine used the, mm -hmm. the precedent of Moshe Feinstein, perhaps even the, your case, and, um, uh, and um, invalidated the marriage based on a Mekah Taut. Um, and, and that is one of the major ways in which uh, our Dianine will invalidate marriages when all else fails. Um, there's more, and for anyone interested, we could chat offline, but as a final, final thing, I just want to say the following. Just go to the end, skip the wedding night brawl case. Um, <laughs> uh, we are here to help. We are open for business and we want, if you know people who uh, cannot get their get, who are being extorted to get their get, the Beitin is not responding to their attempts to get a get. Any of the broad definitions of, of this that fit a situation that you are in, your friends are in, your congregants are in, your colleagues are in, please call us. We can help. We will do everything possible to help. That's the phone number. 
Um, that's my email. We can give you Rabbi Warburg's email or Rabbi Bigman, the Av Besden's email. Also, we are looking for help in promoting our message um, about humanity, about compassion, about halacha. Please follow us on Twitter at ibaitdin um, and on Instagram at internationalbaitdin, also on Facebook, um, dispelling myths and promoting um, justice so everyone can help uh, by doing those simple things. Um, and I just want to thank again, Ori Litzadek, for the opportunity to be with you today. And I know this was heavy material. Um, and, um, and I hope this was a, a kind of helpful presentation about what we're doing. Uh, Rabbi Krauss used to say that uh, <laughs> until uh, this is a problem for everyone in the community. It's not just a problem for the people who experience it. It's a systemic communal problem. And we are invested in using halakha to solve the problem uh, whenever we can. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining. Take care. Shkoyah. Yeah.